Pedro Lemebel's My Tender Matador, Tengo Miedo Torero, literally, I'm Scared Bullfighter, of 2001, features an unlikely hero or heroine who plays an unsung part in a political plot designed to bring down the Chilean dictator Augusto Pinochet in spectacular fashion. The plot, based on an assassination attempt undertaken by left-wing guerrillas in September 1986, fails in its objective. Pinochet survives, shaken but otherwise virtually unscathed, eventually he was able to leave power more or less on his own terms, four years later, after losing a plebiscite on the continuance of military rule. The Social Democrats who replaced him were lauded for managing a bloodless, pacted transition from dictatorship to democracy, which relied on savvy public relations and use of the media that channeled widespread public disaffection by peaceful means. But Lemabel returned to the more extreme and desperate measures employed by some to bring down tyranny. He recovers the radicalism of the anti-Pinochet resistance and installs new subjectivities and alliances, otherwise often invisible, at the heart of the fray. The result is in part a narrative of radicalization and in part a love story, both of which disturbed the illusion of bland consensus and enforced political amnesia that would hold sway once democracy returned. Imagining and embellishing a flutter of queer subversion at the heart of both the resistance to Pinochet and the dictator's inner circle itself, Lemabel reclaims history, turning failure into a kind of success, much as gay men and others have reclaimed the slurs and insults thrown at them to undermine the supposed certainties of a society that tries to keep them at the margins of what is really going on. We do not know the true names of either of the two key characters in Lemabel's novel. The main character is known only as the Queen of the Corner, though during the course of the narrative she is given other epithets from princess to maricon, homo or faggot. In the original Spanish she is La Loca del Frente, which translates literally as the mad woman from the front. Frente or front is both an indication of spatial positioning, she is out front, in front of us, and also perhaps a hint to the fact that over the course of the narrative, her story becomes wrapped up with that of the Frente Patriotico Manuel Rodriguez, the Manuel Rodriguez Patriotic Front, the guerrilla organization plotting to take out Pinochet. Loca, meanwhile, is a term used originally as a slur, for either effeminate gay men or transvestites. In Chile and elsewhere, the word has been reclaimed, as has queer in the English-speaking world, and is often worn as a badge of pride, not least because, with its connotation of disruption and dissidence, it retains the notion that there may be something subversive about non-normative sexualities and or gender presentations. Locas tend to be marginal figures, often, as here, associated with street hustling and prostitution. Lemabel, however, has placed a loca firmly at the centre of his narrative. For the most part, we see the world through her eyes, and accordingly I'm using feminine pronouns, she, her, to refer to her, even though others with whom she interacts sometimes use their masculine equivalents, he, him. More generally, she makes us question the dichotomy of male and female, 
for the local children, for instance, she is some kind of androgynous fairy tale creature that they delicately addressed as they saw fit. It is from this uncertain and unstable positioning that we are encouraged to identify with her point of view and to see both the Chilean dictatorship and the anti-Pinochet opposition aslant from the margins. The other key character in the story is Carlos, the young revolutionary who initially asks La Loca to store some bulky boxes in her flat, telling her that they are books, just censored books. But she knows, and we know, that there is something that Carlos is not telling her. And it turns out that one of those things is his real name. Carlos is but a pseudonym, a nom de guerre he uses as part of his activity in his revolutionary cell. One day, La Loca finds he has left his identity card behind, but she chooses not to look at it, in case it breaks the spell of her growing affection for him. And what if his name wasn't Carlos? What if he had lied and his name was Cornelio Sanhuesa, for, for example? How horrible! How could she still love him if he had the name of a plumber or a blacksmith? She preferred not to know. Later she tells him she has his ID, and he asks whether she wants to know his real name, with the caveat that, I will prefer, for security's sake, that you know me by Carlos. That's my alias. La Loca says she understands. When I performed in transvestite shows, I had a nickname, a drag name, the queens call it. He protests that, that's totally different, darling. This is political. We use a different name so we can function clandestinely. But perhaps it's not so different after all. La Loca's adoption of a drag name is also political. And she is asking him to rethink his conception of what is political and what is not. Long before Carlos embarked upon his cloak and dagger conspiracies to bring down the dictatorship, the older Loca already had a lifetime's experience of manipulating names and identities, of risking her skin in public and private. She is hardly the naive that Carlos sometimes take her to be, though if he wants her to play dumb, for him she will take on that role too. Both La Loca and Carlos, then, are play-acting, playing a part, or multiple parts, for each other and for others, in what is a complex game, or perhaps the dance, a seductive but risky pas de deux. Given this, I wonder what you think the novel has to say about truth and reality, about appearance and disguise. Who or what is the real Carlos? the authentic Queen of the Corner. And what about Pinochet and his wife? The real figures whom Lemabel fictionalizes, taking the liberty allowed by literary fiction to portray them as we may not have seen them before. Where is the truth in all this? And how much does it matter? Pause the video, write down some ideas, add them also in the comments if you wish. While you do that, I'll have a pisco and soda. But I'll be right back. My tender matador maintains a delicate tension between fiction and reality, fantasy and truth. It does matter, for instance, that the boxes that La Loca is asked to look after contain 
presumably, munitions, rather than books. And that the heavy metal tube that Carlos and a friend bring by later contains, again, presumably, a rocket launcher. It matters because these are the weapons that will be employed in the attempted assassination of the dictator. It is vital for all concerned that this truth should not be revealed. All the effort at concealment is far from mere play-acting. And perhaps it is better not to know what hides behind it. La Loca is tempted to unpack the tube that looks like a submarine torpedo. And what if it is? Doubt stayed her ringed fingers and checked her impulse. Better for her just to carry on with her decorative drama. She puts the thing in a corner and uses it as the pedestal for a flower pot. It is the decorative drama at which La Loca is so skilled that it is the reason, we sense, why she has been chosen as cover for the guerrilla's clandestine activity. Similarly, when she and Carlos head out to the countryside to reconnoiter the isolated road leading to Pinochet's rural, rural retreat, where the ambush on his convoy will take place. At a police checkpoint, Carlos encourages La Loca to play up her difference. How about you put on your hat? I'm telling you, put it on and do your drag queen thing. The malleability of her identity enables both her and those around her to pass for what they are not. On the other hand, and precisely because neither the novel nor its characters spend much time in revelation or rationalization, the details of the assassination plot, for instance, are never explained. We are encouraged to take surfaces or appearances seriously in their own right. La Loca is not simply pretending. She invests herself, invests herself, in a performance from which she constructs a new identity, new habits and relationships such as the kinship relations she establishes with her loca friends, Rana and Lupe. Visiting them, even Carlos feels at home, in this lair of maricones, as if in some other life he had known Rana, that huge fairy godmother dressed in pants and a black shirt, who looked at him with warmth and affection. It is Rana who teaches La Loca to embroider, giving her a skill and helping to take her off the streets. Embroidery is both decoration and elaboration. To embroider is also to dramatize or exaggerate. In Spanish, moreover, the word bordar carries with it an echo of the bordes, or margins that the locas inhabit. La loca makes a living from such embellishment and her clients include the highest echelons of the military. As a small act of resistance, however, she decides not to hand over the tablecloth she has embroidered for Doña Catita, on which, in any case, she had refused to add the Chilean coat of arms. I just thought it would have looked a bit overdone. How can I say it? Tacky. A tablecloth that would have been the piece de resistance, at a celebration of the September 11th, 1973 coup, to which Pinochet himself and his wife have been inv invited. For La Loca is not the only person to take appearances seriously. Interspersed with the story of La Loca del Frente and Carlos, the unlikely revolutionary and her unlikely lover, are a sequence of vignettes told from the perspective of Augusto Pinochet himself. In placing us in the position of the general, 
Lemma Bell borrows from the tradition of the Latin American dictator novel. Examples include the Guatemalan Miguel Angel Asturias's The President and the Paraguayan Augusto Ro Bastos's I the Supreme, as well as Garcia Marquez's The Autumn of the Patriarch. Many of these novels take real life historical dictators from the region and ventriloquize them, imagining sovereign power from the inside, at its most intimate and vulnerable moments. Acknowledging perhaps that writing and power have always gone hand in hand in the region, they aim to subvert dictatorial pretensions from within. Lemabel's Pinochet is hempecked and emasculated. His wife's irritating chatter scarcely allows him a moment's rest. She will not stop chirping from morning to night. Foremost among her obsessions is the advice handed out by her personal stylist, Gonzalo. She bombards the general with an endless flow of his recounted comments and recommendations. Week after week, the same conversations filled his head. Gonzalo told me, Gonzalo says, Gonzalo thinks. And he says that everything, absolutely everything, is a question of aesthetics and color. That people aren't really unhappy with you or your government. That the problem is the gray color of your uniforms. Via his wife, in other words, Pinochet is at the receiving end of a barrage of tips and tricks from a Chilean version of Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. And while not all of Gonzalo's observations may be on point, changing the color scheme of the army's uniforms is not going to stop the wave of protests against the dictatorship that is engulfing the city. He and the general's wife are surely right to point out that the dictator too has an image to project and protect. The first lady notes, for instance, that it was hardly a good look when Pinochet and his entourage received a chilly reception even in apartheid South Africa. In fact, here Lemabel is rewriting the story of the general's abortive trip to the Philippines under Ferdinand Marcos in 1980, when, as Tobias Ruprecht reports, he ended up stranded on the tarmac of an airfield in Fiji. It seemed like we were going to spend our lives flying around without anybody letting us land. Because nobody likes you now. It's not just the communists anymore. Similarly, she nags him about the famous photograph, taken soon after the coup, in which Pinochet appears at the forefront of a phalanx of military men, sitting down, arms crossed, dark glasses covering his eyes. Why did you wear dark glasses that day, even though it was cloudy? His wife had demanded of him. Don't you see how the communists used that picture to attack you? He looked like a gangster, a mafioso, with those ugly glasses. Now, however, the general puts on his glasses so he can take a quick nap behind them to escape his wife's constant commentary. Although his dreams, as he snoozes, are full of nightmarish images of his own funeral, in which he is sinking up to his knees in a sea of pitch and tar, cadavers, bones, and fleshless hands that pulled him down until he was drowning in the thick molasses. The general, in Lemabel's imagining, can find no rest, no security, even if he does survive the plot to kill him, planned by Carlos, and his friends. Lemabel reimagines the failed assassination attempt from the inside of Pinochet's armored limousine as a humiliation that reveals the general's weakness and terror. In the back seat, the dictator was trembling like a leaf, not daring to utter a word, paralyzed, unable to get up off the floor. Worse, or 
better still. He was crouching in the warm paste of his own shit, which ran slowly down his leg, exuding the putrid stench of fear. The novel delights in undoing or taking us behind Pinochet's performance of macho military valour, to show us that it was all just an act. Lemabel even implies that, despite his reiterated homophobia, as if the communists weren't bad enough, now homosexuals are prancing around the countryside. The general is not immune to the charms of a handsome young cadet. He kept a close, close watch out of the corner of his eye on the cadet as he walked away down the thin finger of sand along the banks of the river, his adolescent figure bending over like a flamenco from time to time to pick a flower he chewed on in his watermelon-coloured mouth. Pinochet has the boy discharged almost immediately. But this attempt to purify or cleanse his immediate surroundings is doomed to fail. The shit that soils his uniform comes from within. The novel cuts cinematically, straight from the shit-stained general in his limousine, to La Loca, in a CD pickup theatre, that likewise smells of shit, mixed with semen, deodorant, and male cologne. The margins in the centre are not so far apart, and indeed the movie theatre is around the corner from Santiago's Central Square, or Plaza de Armas, where she can in anxiously inquire what the hell had happened while she was in this movie? The dictator is still alive, she hears. A miracle. He must be in league with the devil. But the guerrillas have also escaped. Every single one of them, mister. Now it is time for everyone to scatter. And the loca del frente, potentially compromised because of her involvement in the plot, also has to move on of time only for one last meeting with Carlos, on the beach in the resort town of Viña del Mar. We know nothing of what happens next. In actuality, some of the guerrillas involved in the 1986 attack on Pinochet were rounded up and killed, but others got away. Carlos invites La Loca to join him as he flees for asylum in Cuba. But instead... She melts into the city and into the snippets of popular culture, cheesy song from which she had come, leaving nothing behind but the tablecloth, repurposed for her romantic farewell with her almost lover, the doe-eyed revolutionary. Its embroidered finery is left to the incoming tide. She, for her part, vanishes without a trace. We still do not know her name. But by writing a role for someone like her into the script of Chile's history, otherwise forgotten behind the screen of the democratic transition's willed amnesia, Lemabel queers the memory of the anti-Pinochet opposition while making scatological fun of the dictator's facade of macho virility. <laughs>